thoughts and we train the mind to let go of thoughts. Because when we investigate further, we begin to see that our mental defilements are really the thinking because of that reaction that we all have. And that's why the Buddha gave that very radical teaching, very challenging teaching, when he said, when you see, just see, when you hear, just hear. It sounds simple, but it's very challenging. Because we're so used to reacting, right, from, from a young age. Very challenging. And then he went on further to say, when we think, just think, when we know, just know. So then you think, what do you mean by when you think, just think? <laughs> Again, it's related to what I just mentioned. When you need to think, you think logically, rationally, and when you don't need to think, you put it down, you put thinking aside, and you return to present moment awareness. But initially, because we don't have this training, this education, from a young age, we don't understand what it means to return to awareness or to rest in present moment awareness. But what is very interesting is that when we were very young, our minds used to be like that. And maybe some of you don't really understand this because I think some of you grew up always with, you know, electronic things, right? TV, and then you had, you know, little video games, right? And now we have the phone, the, the smartphone. But I didn't grow up with any of this. I didn't have television. And I grew up on, on a tropical island. It's not as hot and humid like Malaysia. But uh, when you're with nature, your mind is in a very calm state and you're just looking and listening. And you're not reacting, you're not judging, criticizing, liking, not liking. That's why in Zen meditation, we call it the original mind or the beginner's mind. Where you're, where you're seeing the environment in nature with a very open, fresh mind. And you have a sense of wonder. Your mind is in a state of wonder. And you see that life is a, is a great mystery. But then we start going to school, and we start learning subjects, and then of course we're thinking more, we're talking more, and then we lose that, that childlike state of mind. So this is why in India, when the mind became silent, and it happened in a very spontaneous way, without effort, without expectation, it brought them back to childhood. So the mind was totally open, fresh, innocent, and there was no more thinking, no more reactive thinking. And we all experience this when we were young, being in a timeless state. Okay, so I'll demonstrate this uh, moving meditation. So just place your palms on your knees. And of course you can do this while sitting in a chair also. And if you're right-handed, you start with your right hand. If you're left-handed, you start with your left. Okay? So I'm right-handed. So, so raise your right or left hand up on the edge like this. Okay, are you getting any feedback? 
no echo? You're not getting the echo, okay? Yeah. So, so raise your right palm or left palm on the edge like this, and slowly lifting, and slowly mindfully to the stomach, and be aware of that touch sensation in the stomach area, abdomen. Then the left or right hand, the other hand, up on the edge, slowly lifting, slowly to the stomach. Be aware of your hand touching the other hand. And keep your hands very loose, very relaxed, not tight. Then the right or left hand, slowly up to the chest. Be aware of the touch in the chest area, out, down, touching the knee, and palm down. The other hand, left or right, slowly up to the chest, out, down, and down. Again, right or left, up. Lifting to the stomach, touching left or right, lifting to the stomach. Again, be aware of that touch sensation. Hands are relaxed. Then the right or left hand up to the chest, out, down and down, other hand up, touching, out, down, and down, again right or left, You begin to feel the rhythm of the movements. So you're aware of each movement and when the hand touches the body. So this brings us to the present moment.
So you can close your eyes if you wish, or you can keep them open. This is why if you're doing mindful breathing, anapanasati, and you're having difficulty focusing the mind, this practice is very beneficial. And of course, when the mind is thinking too much, you know, worrying, obsessing, regretting so with this practice you don't have to struggle uh, with the thinking mind, otherwise known as the monkey mind. And uh, and while we do this, just be aware of any thoughts which arise in the mind. And then return to the hand movements and the hand touching the body. So this is how we train the mind to focus and to let go of unnecessary thinking.
And sometimes if your mind is caught up in a story, a story, a mini drama, you can use the, the mental noting technique where you just say to yourself, it's only thinking, thinking, thinking. Only thinking, thinking, thinking. Or worrying, worrying, worrying. And you come back to the present moment. Hands moving and touching. And you find after a few minutes of doing this, you begin to experience a calmness. And if you're doing this at home, you can, uh, can put some music on if you like. Any music or chanting that you find very calming, very soothing. You find it can be beneficial. especially when you've had a very busy, stressful day at work. Hmm? Hmm? So this can help, help us to let go, just let go of the day's activities hmm? with its many challenges. This coming back to the present moment. And with this practice, we can also do the reflection on body and mind, physical and mental process, what we call rupa and nama in Pali language.
for instance, the hands moving and touching the body, that is rupa, the physical. And the awareness of the hands moving and touching, that is the mind, nama. Again, the hands moving and touching is the physical rupa and the awareness of the hands moving and touching is the mind, mental. So there is rupa and nama, that's all. No I, no me, no mine. And when the mind becomes more calm, more focused, not so agitated, restless, you can go to mindful breathing. And while you're doing the mindful breathing, you can also reflect on rupa and nama. The physical sensation of the breath is rupa, the physical. And the awareness of the physical sensation of the breath is mind, nama.
And as we mentioned this morning, when we bring mindfulness in the present moment, we can see this reality of physical and mental process. And we're alive because we're a process. It's a very complex process. And because we're a process of body and mind, we have to recharge this process. In the same way, you have to recharge your cell phones. And you begin to see that it is thinking itself that is creating um, mm, our mental defilements. Mm. You know, when you, like for example, when you keep worrying about something, obsessing about something, uh, then you're, you're actually clinging, uh, mentally you're clinging to something. And this is why the thinking, the, the clinging mind is so strong. Because it's related to thinking and memory. Thinking and memory. And of course, when there's craving in the mind, you know, I would, I want this or I want that, you know or I wish I could have this, or I want to achieve something, or, or I want to become something. You see that it is thinking hmm, that is creating this, uh, this form of craving, wanting. Okay, we can tr we can now try the the it's called balancing chi, and chi is energy, and chi is everywhere. There's energy everywhere. Everything in nature, there's energy chi. In India, it's called prana, but in in Chinese, it's uh, chi. And she, of course, is in this body-mind process. And the balancing chi, it looks very simple, but it's actually very powerful. It's where as you breathe in, you bring your palms up, and then breathing out, palms down, like this. Breathe in, breathe out.
and you move according to the length of your breath. So just experiment and see the length of your breath and move accordingly. Breathing in, breathing out. And you find that when you breathe and move at the same time, it's an easy way to focus the mind, especially when you're in a very busy environment. Hmm? Say when you're in the workplace, hmm? when you're in school, of course, or if you're working in the hospital. So you, you can do this either sitting down or standing up. So it looks simple, but actually it's very powerful when you practice this. Because it brings your mind immediately in the present moment. Especially when you're in a busy environment, as we mentioned before. Mm -hmm. And of course, we can let go, we can relax huh? all the stress you are experiencing. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you're upset for some reason, mm -hmm. or irritable. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're irritable. Mm -hmm. Say with a co worker. Mm -hmm or another student or with your supervisor, you know, at work. Also, by doing this, it helps us not to react, mm -hmm. not to react so easily okay, to somebody's um, mm -hmm. unpleasant words, mm -hmm. if somebody is being unpleasant to you, you know, criticizing you, mm -hmm. judging you. Mm -hmm. or even being upset with you, angry with you. By doing this, it helps you not to react. Just focus and keep calm. And sometimes it helps if you smile. So as we do this, just try smiling mindfully.
and of course with practice it becomes easier and, and it feels more natural hmm? it feels more natural when you do this hmm? and if you feel hmm, that you you're going to get angry you're going to get you know upset hmm? try to remember to do this just breathe, move, and smile. Okay, and in, in Qigong, there's also one movement that we do, of course, and next month we'll also be doing this. That if you're feeling mm, any strong emotion, including frustration, mm, you can do this. Mm. And it's where you, you breathe out, and as you breathe in, you just go up like this. Ah. And as you go, ah, you smile. <laughs> so you can try it. Huh? Don't be shy. Let's just go like this. Breathe in. Ah. 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 And then just come back to breathing in, breathing out. And while doing this, you can also see Rupa and Nama very clearly. You can see the body and the mind. Hands moving. As we breathe in and out, that is Rupa, the body, the physical, and the awareness of the hands moving, of course the body breathing, and that is the mind, mental. Just body and mind, physical and mental. Rupa and Nama.
Oh, okay. Yes. So if you find yourself reacting or attempting to react, you can, you can try this. Because our reactions are so habitual. In October, when I was at the Mahavihara, we were preparing for a katina. You remember a katina ceremony? So early morning, of course, we had volunteers coming, you know, to help set up the tents, to prepare for katina. And at that time, I got a chance to do walking, brisk walking. And for fast walking, I have to wear running shoes. I can't do it in slippers because I have, I have sore feet. So one of the volunteers was a young man. I think he came with his parents. And he saw me walking with running shoes. And he reacted, got very shocked, very upset. <gasps> a monk is wearing running shoes. He's not supposed to be wearing running shoes, right? Monks are supposed to be wearing slippers. So upset. So fortunately, he went to his parents and complained. Look at that monk. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> They'd never seen a monk wearing running shoes. Not good. He's supposed to be wearing slippers. And fortunately, his parents were very sensible. And he said, what you're doing is wrong. Now go to that monk and apologize. <laughs> of course, when he came to me, I started apologizing. I was so surprised. <laughs> Especially at 6 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> So I said, it's okay, don't worry. I accept your apology. But use it as a learning experience. Stop reacting, stop judging, stop criticizing. And that includes when, you know, at, when you're at school or when you're in the work environment, you be aware of it. Because it's a part of our conditioning, isn't it? Always judging, always reacting. So I said, use it as a learning experience and stop reacting. And also, st stop judging others, you know, your co-workers or your fellow students. And also, stop judging yourself. Learn how to be kind to yourself, how to be kind to others. And I said to him, very matter-of-factly, whether I'm wearing uh, running shoes or not, it's my business, it's not your business, okay? It's my business, not yours. Remember that. And I said, actually, if, if you must know, I'm wearing running shoes because at my age I get sore feet, <laughs> okay? <laughs> I'm not young as you are. So be kind, be kind. <laughs> And that's an aspect of, um, of right attitude, right thinking, right attitude. You're learning how to be more kind, more compassionate, and not to be so judgmental. Because you find when you're, when you're very judgmental of others, you also you're very judgmental of yourself. And that's why we suffer a lot from, um, from guilt, right? Feeling guilty. And then we create a negative image of ourselves. I'm so bad, I'm so awful, I'm so stupid, right? Why did I do that? Why did I say that? I should have done that. I, you know, this should, should, should. And also what is interesting too is that if we're having a, a pleasant relationship with somebody, anyone, you naturally have a pleasant image of them, right? 
You know, when you think of them, when you remember them, it's always with a pleasant image. But if you happen to have a conflict with someone, it can be anyone, it could be a good friend. Of course, it can be a family member also, or a co-worker, or your neighbor. What happens? We create a negative image of that person, right, because of that conflict. So every time you, you think of that person, you see them with that negative image. And the next time you see that person, again, you see them with that negative image. So in other words, you're not seeing them as they are in the present moment. You're seeing them with an image of the past, right? Of the past conflict. Because that's the way the mind works, right? It's always thinking and remembering something. Because thinking is related to memory. This, it is something we can be aware of. How we create negative an, uh, a negative image of others and we create a negative image of ourselves. And that creates, you know, fear and uh, conflict. Because anything negative in the mind produces fear. And of course, you know, the negative judgmental thoughts on top of the negative image. <laughs> Yeah, the mind is so crazy. And this is why the Buddha taught, you know, the, the benefits of mindfulness and the four foundations of mindfulness. Otherwise, we suffer huh, from delusion, from ignorance. Mm -hmm. and the craving and the clinging. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we said too that the clinging mind is very strong simply because it's related to thinking and memory. Mm -hmm. Thinking and memory. Mm -hmm. And every time you know, you're worrying about something, you're obsessing about something, you're holding on to it, right? Mentally, you're holding on to it. And there's a very well-known story, maybe some of you have heard it, but it's very well-known, but it's a good story to repeat because it really demonstrates the, the clinging mind. You know the story about the two monks who are, who are traveling, who are walking one day? Maybe some of you have not heard this. There are two monks. They had to hike all day to get to another monastery. So they started out very early, you know, at dawn. And after walking maybe two, three hours, still early morning, they came to a river. It's a very wide river but it's very shallow, so getting across was no problem. And when they got to the river, they saw a beautiful young lady standing there by the river, and she was a bit anxious, because she was wearing a, you know, a long, beautiful uh, kimono or silk dress, and she was not the athletic type, you know, she was very delicate, very dainty. So she was anxious about getting across the river without getting, you know, her beautiful dress wet, although the water was very shallow. So the older monk immediately knew what her problem was. And he said, come, young lady, I'll take you across. And quickly he lifts her up in his arms, you know, light as a feather, and he takes her across the river. And the younger monk start to freak out. <laughs> Ayo, what is the monk doing? Oh my God. You know, he's breaking all the rules that monks should not do. 
you know, when allowed to touch monks, uh, touch a woman, especially young and beautiful ones like this. <laughs> and yet he's scaring her as if, you know, they are lovers. Oh, terrible. I cannot believe this. And they get across the river. The monk puts the lady down and says, you know, have a nice day. And she says, oh, thank you so much. You're so kind. And they keep walking. And the whole day, the young monk keeps obsessing about this young lady. I cannot believe what this monk has done. You know, I used to respect him. I looked up to him. He was my role model. And he's done this terrible thing. He's obsessing. How can I keep respecting him when he's done such, so awful? Even when they stop to rest and have lunch. And the older monk, of course, is just enjoying the nature, enjoying, you know, natural environment, hiking, listening to the birds, looking at wild animals. And the younger monk is keep obsessing, obsessing. And at one moment he's saying, you know, if, if, if the lady, if she was older or ugly, it wouldn't be so bad. But she's so beautiful. <laughs> you know, nice slim, slim legs and all that. Obsessing. And he's thinking, when we get back to our monastery, I have to report him to our teacher. How can I keep respecting me? It's such a terrible thing he has done. And finally they get to this monastery, you know, after sunset. They've been, you know, hiking the whole day. They have a wash, they have something to eat, and they're ready for bed. And the younger monk, finally, he couldn't keep silent anymore. He's been, he's been suffering all day, <laughs> obsessing about this woman. And he said to the older monk, I cannot believe what you did today. I'm so upset. And as you look up to you, I know I can't respect you anymore. And I'm thinking of reporting you to our teacher when we get back to our monastery. Because he's been obsessing here to get all this stuff out. And the other monk said, What are you talking about? And he said, don't you remember this morning by the river, this beautiful young lady was there, and you picked her up, and you carried her across, and you held her in your arms as if you're lovers. Why did you do that? You've broken all the rules, especially young and beautiful women like that. Why did you do that? I used to, you know, respect you so much. And the other monk says, my goodness, I have left that lady by the river many hours ago, but you are still carrying her. See? You're still carrying her. It's a good story because it demonstrates you know, the obsessive, clinging, and suffering mind. Huh? You see that? Obsessive, clinging, and suffering mind. But that's the nature of clinging, isn't it? And once I had a very dramatic uh, lesson in letting go when I was in Sri Lanka. It was the second year being a monk at my teacher's temple. And the first part of the year, the, the climate was very unusual. It became very, very dry. Because normally in the tropics, like in, in Malaysia, you have a regular rain, right? R rainfall. Very dry. And some areas, the paddy fields, you know, the rice fields were drying up. The, the level in the, in the village wells, you know, were going down. Afternoons were very hot, very uncomfortable. So I was not feeling very, uh, very calm. <laughs> and I began to miss uh, Western food. And I was thinking, oh, if, if I could only be in Singapore, even for one hour, and I could have, you know, frozen yogurt, ice cream, cold drinks, 
you know, I'm I'm sitting here in Sri Lanka eating rice and curry every day, and I'm dealing with this awful climate. Hmm? And then I have to go to the main temple to have lunch. And guess what I'm having for lunch? The same rice and curry. <laughs> And I had to climb just a sh short steps, few steps. And while I was climbing the step, I just saw something move at the right corner of my eye. I didn't know what it was. But just natural instinct, I just froze. Just natural instinct. And I looked down right there. Psss, was a cobra ready to strike. Fortunately, I hadn't stepped on it. And when I realized what it was right there, you can imagine, I've never been so awake in my life. You know, all your nerve endings are totally alert to the present moment. And you're so awake, you're so alert, that whatever dukkha, whatever rubbish nonsense that was in the mind, zoom, it's gone. <laughs> you, you can understand that. Instant letting go. <laughs> no choice. It was amazing. And of course, there was no time. There was only the present moment. No past, no future. I looked at the cobra, the cobra looked at me. <laughs> and somehow it's like we're communicating, yeah, non-verbally. And fortunately, snakes are, are very shy creatures. They don't like to hang around human beings. <laughs> he quickly turned and he quickly headed into the bush. And I was so amazed that a creature without legs could move so fast. Hmm? How can a creature without legs can move so fast? And as it was moving away, you know, at the back of the hood, I don't know if you've seen a photo or a cobra snake close up, it has a very beautiful pattern on the hood. And I saw that pattern because I was so alert, so awake, I could admire the beauty of the snake. Mm -hmm. Although potentially very dangerous, but I could see the beauty of it because the mind was so alert, so awake. Mm -hmm. There was no um, aversion there was no aversion to the snake. And of course, I admit, there was some, uh, how do you say, I felt relieved that it hadn't bitten me. <laughs> and then it just disappeared. And I remember just standing there and just in awe. And just looking at the tropical environment. And everything was just so vibrant. Because, you know, the mind is so awake, so alert. It was like being a young child again. Once I was relating the story to some people in, uh, in Canada. And these Sri Lankan friends, they have invited a friend from South India. I think they were work colleagues at the company they were working at. And, and this uh, colleague was from South India. And after I related the story, he said, you know, in South India, people have this experience, you know, close encounter with cobra snakes. They have it all the time. <laughs> For them, it's common because there are so many snakes. And sometimes you encounter them where you least expect them. Like, you know, you go into the washroom, right? <laughs> and there's a cobra snake. It's like that. Or you go into your bedroom or the kitchen, 
it is a cobra snake. And in South India, they also have the king cobra, you know, the bigger, the bigger uh, variety. But it's about, again, applying mindfulness when you see the mind, you know, worrying, obsessing, you know, clinging to something. Because you find that apart, behind that that um, that worrying, which is great, is always anxiety. And there's a a kind of anxiety there when you are worrying, right? And this is really also related to, to one's addiction to the smartphone. Hmm? You know, when you feel that. That, that um, strong desire. I have to check the phone, right? I have to check for messages. But behind that is always anxiety because you think, if I don't check for, for messages at this moment, somehow the world is going to come to an end. It feels that way, but of course the world is not going to come to an end. <laughs> but it's the anxiety. Huh? That anxiety is giving you that impression that I have to check it. And as you may know, most of the messages are not really important. Yes, if you're having, you know, like a family emergency or something, that's another story, but most of the messages are not that important, they're not that urgent. So this is something we can reflect on. And again, if you're feeling some, some anxiety, you know, do the, the hand movements or do the balancing chi. And remind yourself, the world is not going to come to an end. <laughs> well, eventually it will, but it will take a few um, million years yet. Because, <laughs> you know, eventually the sun, when the hydrogen becomes depleted, the sun is going to become a red giant. Maybe you're, some of you are aware of this. It's going to expand. And then if there's still life on this planet, it's all going to end. And all the water, all the oceans are going to dry up. And eventually, the old star, the old sun is going to become a supernova, right? It's going to explode. But we, we, but we don't have to get anxious about it, it's because it's still... It's going to take some time. <laughs> you know, when scientists back in, in the uh, 19th century or 18th century, when they're trying to figure out all the scientific facts of the world and the solar system, they initially estimated that the sun could be no more than about 10 million years. No more than 10 million years. Yeah. And of course, the Christians believed through their Bible interpretation that the world, the planet, is only maybe 6,000 years. And the reason why these uh, scientists thought that the, the sun could be no more than 10 million years is because they, they didn't understand the process of the sun, what type of process it was. And they couldn't believe how this process, and it still amazes me when I reflect on the sun, how can something that is producing so much energy, so much heat, so much light, it can, how it can last so long. 
And the amazing thing about the solar process is that it doesn't depend on oxygen, right? Because on planet Earth, we need oxygen for things to burn, right? But the sun does not, e does not use, need oxygen. That is what is amazing. Because it's a very unique process. And as you know, it is only about halfway through its life cycle. So what scientists are estimating now, uh, that the planet is much older than we could have possibly imagined, and the sun is much older, and it's just halfway through its life cycle. So we, we still have a few billion years left. <laughs> So we don't have to be to get too anxious about that. Also, a part of our conditioning or reaction, the way we're educated, not only to judge, criticize, and so on, but also to compare. To compare. And this habit of comparing ourselves with others, it's very uh, unhealthy. And it produces conflict in the mind. Because as you know, when you compare yourself with others, you feel uh, inferior. Well, most people do. You feel, you know, I'm not as good as that person, right? I'm not as smart. If you're a student, I'm not as smart as that person. Of course, if you're in the business world, working world, you know, I'm not as successful as that person. On rare occasions, somebody will feel superior. I'm better than others. But most people will feel inferior. And of course, when parents compare you to your other siblings, you know how awful that feels, right? <laughs> or sometimes parents will compare you to your cousins, right? <laughs> or to your neighbors, or you know, of the children of their good friends, and it always feels awful. Unless, of course, your parents are always, uh, you know, praising you. <laughs> So this is something we can reflect on, the, this habit of comparing, of comparison. It's actually very uh, unhealthy. And if you find yourself doing it, just say, I should stop this. It's unhealthy. It's, it's not beneficial. It's a source of suffering and conflict. And one of the fears we experience is the fear of not being successful hmm? or the fear of failure, hmm? fear of not achieving. And it comes from that, from that habit of uh, comparison. Hmm? Hmm? And you start to feel insecure. And of course, you start to compare yourself eh, with others. But it starts with, with your parents comparing you to your siblings and so on. Once, many years ago, at a Dhamma camp, I was speaking to a student. And he was very bright. Not only academically, but he was a very intelligent person. And he said to me, every time I have to study for, for an exam or a test, I'm so anxious, so worried. So, 
But I said, why? You're a very good student. You know, you're an A student. Why? Why are you so worried about? He said, the problem is not me, it's my parents. And they're both school teachers. This is what surprised me. But to show you that you can be a school teacher and still be very ignorant and ego-centered. Because he was naturally bright, you know, from young age, and he was always first in his class. Hmm? Always first. So you can imagine, his parents are always very proud of him and always, you know, saying, oh, my son, right? He's number one, he's number one, he's number one. And it just so happened in the last two years, he was either number two or number three in his class for the first time, but still with a high A, sometimes even A plus, you know, A, A plus average. But his parents were not looking at his marks. He had to be number one, right? So, of course, they were putting pressure on him. You have to be number one. So you see that although they're teachers, but they, they knew nothing about unconditional love, right? It's about their egos. You see that? Very immature, very immature behavior. You know, although they're adults, they're teachers, but it's a very immature, ignorant behavior. And I said to him, I really want to speak to your parents. And I'm prepared to give them a good scolding. Yes, I said so. Of course, he was a little nervous and said, it's okay, Banty, I'll talk to them. I'll talk to them. <laughs> because he, knew, he was smart. He knew that it's not his problem, it's his parents. And I said to him, don't worry, I'm not from Malaysia, I'm from Canada. I'll scold them and leave. <laughs> they can't get me. They can't get me. <laughs> no, but he said, thank you, I'll speak to them. I said, yes, you speak to them. But it really shows you about, you know, about mental developments. And how adults can still be very immature, very ignorant. And we said before that normally it is our habit of identifying not only with the body, but with feelings and emotions, because that is the way we are brought up. For example, a happy feeling arises, we say, I'm happy, I'm feeling good, no problem. It seems so natural, isn't it? But then an unhappy feeling arises, and we say, I'm unhappy, or I'm upset, I'm sad, I'm bored, I'm frustrated, and so on. Now, initially, when we say, I am happy, no problem. Why? Because it's a pleasant feeling, right? It's a pleasant experience, no problem. But when we say, I am unhappy, I'm upset, I'm bored, I'm frustrated, I'm scared, whatever, there is dukkha. There's some disturbance in the mind simply because these are unpleasant states. And what the Dhamma is teaching us is that whatever we experience, whatever, whether it's pleasant or unpleasant, they're subject to change, they're impermanent. And also what is interesting, when we become too attached to say a happy feeling or any type of pleasurable experience, eventually we experience frustration. I don't know if you ever experienced this. I know a lot of people in North America do because, you know, they're 
society is so based on, you know, enjoying themselves and being entertained. Mm -hmm. Always seeking, you know, more pleasure, more happiness, and so on. But they keep suffering from frustration simply because they're only temporary experiences. Yes, they feel good, but they don't last. And anything that feels very good, very pleasurable, we want it to be permanent. Or we want it to last as long as possible. But it keeps changing. This is why an aspect of, of wisdom, right understanding, is just to see the truth of change, of impermanence. So, but it doesn't mean that we can't enjoy things in life. Of course, we can enjoy many things, but don't expect it to be permanent. Just accept when it changes, it changes. That's all. And it's good to, to have this wisdom in mind, especially when we're experiencing something unpleasant, right? Including boredom. Because, you know, when you're young, it's very easy to be bored. And these days it's more easier because you're always, you know, you have all this electronic stimulation. But monks also experience frust um, boredom. Because, you know, initially you're very inspired. But because things change, sometimes you're not so inspired. Especially, you know, say when you're sick, the weather is bad or you're bored with the food, hmm? like Sri Lankan rice and curry. And I didn't have internet <laughs> in Sri Lanka, so I couldn't watch YouTube, imagine. <laughs> Sometimes I would get bored. So when we are following this practice, then we learn how to deal with boredom. First, we objectify the boredom. Hmm? There is boredom. Now oh, there's a state of boredom. Because initially, our immediate reaction is, I am bored, right? We identify with that boredom, perfectly natural. It's like, I am happy, I am unhappy. And of course, when we say, I am bored, the I wants to escape boredom, right? Because mm -hmm. the I doesn't want to be bored. Mm -hmm. You want some stimulation, some kind of stimulation. So we try to escape that boredom. And of course, there are countless ways of es escaping boredom. And one of them is to go shopping. And if you don't want to spend money or you don't have much money for shopping, at least you can go window shopping. Just look, looking. But when we are using mindfulness, we objectify that boredom. We say, there is boredom. Oh, there's a state of boredom. And you remind yourself, this too shall pass. It is impermanent. It is a temporary mental state. And what I found interesting in my own practice is just to sit and experience the boredom. What it really feels like, because normally we don't do that, right? We say, I am bored, and we escape boredom, right? So many ways. But he said, yes, there's boredom, it's impermanent. And you just sit with it and you actually experience what it, what it really feels like. Hmm? What is the texture of it? You know, the sensation in the body, in the mind. Then what is really surprising, then it's no longer boring. <laughs> if you just observe it and you just experience it, what it actually feels like. 
because you're not escaping it, right? You're not identifying with it, and you're not, you're not trying to escape it. And before you know it, it goes away, right? It goes away. So maybe you can try that the next time you feel bored. Pain in the body. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, of course, if something is very painful or uncomfortable, it's natural to to do something about it. Say, you know, change your position, you know, if, if your legs are cramped, for example, you know. Say if you're having pain in your legs, your legs, you know, you, you objectify it, but then you naturally move, right? You move to feel comfortable. Because you find, even when, when you get injured, because a few weeks ago I had a small accident, and I realized that, yes, there was a physical accident, you know, there was bleeding, there was bruising, you know, one knee had swollen. But because I was able to keep calm, there was not much mental, emotional suffering. Because very often, we may be in physical pain, but then the mind creates all this drama, right? You begin, to, the mind creates all this mental, emotional drama around that, that pain or that accident. But because, you know, I just observe it, I accept, yes, this happened. There was not much, um, you know, mental, emotional dukkha. And I was patient, I went to the clinic, you know, every two or three days. And before I knew it, it was gone. And after a while, I even forgot about it. But at the time, it was dramatic, because it was totally unexpected. But because I was able to just stay calm, I didn't create all that mental, emotional drama. Because actually most of the dukkha is the mental, emotional drama, right? So as we said before, it's, it's important that we understand thinking, the thinking process. And in the handout I gave you, the, I think it's the second uh, paragraph. Huh? The, the thinking process is a response to memory, past experience, and knowledge. And you can add the word information to it, huh? knowledge, information. Because believe me, I wish I had this teaching when I was in high school. <laughs> it is limited, mechanical, overactive, and leads to confusion and delusion. Because the mind became, you know, very worried, very obsessive, very frustrated. And I looked at the mind and I started to ask, is, is it possible for all this mental, emotional turmoil to stop? Is it possible for all this crazy thinking to stop? Because I saw the connection between thinking and the mental, emotional turmoil. I didn't know the word dukkha at the time, but it, it was dukkha. <laughs> Is it possible? for all this to stop, for the mind to be silent. But I had no teaching, no books, there's nobody I could speak to. And we didn't have a counselor, a student counselor in the school. 
and the only book I had was the Bible. But by that time I realized what I was searching for, longing for, was not in the Bible. There were only just words and words and words, you know, ideas, concepts, beliefs. And I had that longing for understanding, for direct experience. Thinking produces fear, worry, anxiety, craving, greed, envy, jealousy, resentment, feelings of loneliness and isolation, and other emotions and moods. And you can see that it is when we're feeling some loneliness, some sense of isolation, it comes from thinking. It all comes from thinking. And this is why when that feeling arises, not only do we objectify it and know that it is impermanent, it is just a temporary mental state, but when we can do the loving-kindness meditation, it's very beneficial. Although we start with ourselves, we send loving-kindness you know, to family, friends, to neighbors. If you're in the working environment, you send loving-kindness to your work colleagues, your co-workers, even to the ones who are giving you problems, <laughs> including your supervisor. <laughs> Think of everyone in Malaysia, you know. Think of all beings in the world. When you go beyond the self, it helps you hmm? to go beyond this, this sense of isolation, hmm? that I'm all, I'm all alone. Because one of the illusions we all experience, whenever you're experiencing something, let's say if you're feeling upset, you're caught up in that emotion, we tend to think that I'm the only one who's feeling upset. I'm the only one in the whole world who is feeling like this, or feeling frustrated, or feeling bored. But actually, whatever we experience, whether it's ple uh, pleasant or unpleasant, is actually a universal experience. Everyone experiences, you know, loneliness, isolation, frustration, fear, right? Fear is a very universal uh, experience. And it's very go always good to remind ourselves that I am not the only one who's experiencing this. And when we bring that in, in the mind, in consciousness, naturally compassion arises. Not only compassion for ourselves, but compassion for others. And that includes any form of desire, craving, expectation, and so on. Because as I said this morning, desire or craving, you know, the wanting mind, is something very natural in, in, uh, in the human experience, very natural. And it starts at a young age. You know, that wanting mind, it's very natural. And, and there is a skillful way of dealing with, with, with wanting, with craving. Because normally we identify with that desire and we say, you know, I want this, or I must have this, or if I could only get this, right? And we believe that, you know, if I get this, I'll be so happy, and of course I'll be happy for the rest of my life, right? Just like when you're very upset, you think, I'm going to be upset for the rest of my life. This is why it's always beneficial to remind yourself, this too shall pass. This too shall pass. And these four words, it's a good thing to, to write down and to remind yourself. 
Mm -hmm. These four words, they contain the greatest wisdom in human experience. Mm -hmm. This too shall pass. And another good reminder is, whatever I'm experiencing at the moment, whether it's pleasant or unpleasant, is only a temporary mental state, mm -hmm. a changing condition of the mind and not self. It's a very good reminder, a very good reminder. Thinking is time as past and future. So we are conditioned with the idea of past and future because of the thinking process, huh? the thought process. Because as we said this morning, Thinking is a movement in time. All right, it's related to memory, past experience, knowledge, information, and it has the ability to project in the future. And this is why we're conditioned with the idea of past and future. Whereas, whereas when we were very young, we we didn't have that uh, conditioning of time. It was only in the present moment. And those of you who have had young children can relate to that. Or just look at, at um, dogs and cats, right, and birds. <laughs> when I was in Sri Lanka last year, and there was so much bad news about Sri Lanka, what I did, I didn't watch the news, I just looked at the birds and I looked at the monkeys in the trees. And the monkeys, they taught me a lot. Because <laughs> they don't care about, you know, all the human drama that's going on. They don't care about the, the you know, the ec economic problems. They don't care about the corrupt politicians, you know, and so on. They're just in nature. It's quite amazing. And I was very, sometimes I was very jealous of them because some of the mangoes were very high up and I couldn't reach them. But for monkeys, no problem. <laughs> so I was competing with the monkeys regarding the mangoes. <laughs> the self or ego, the idea of I, me, and mine, is a product of the thinking process as a collection of memories. We mentioned this this morning, but I think some of you are not here this morning, right? Some of the youth group, you are not here this morning. Yeah. Yeah, I'll speak about the, the memories. Awareness is always in the present moment. It is clear, unlimited, and intelligent. It is the Buddha mind, or the Buddha nature. The one who knows. The one who is awake, calm, and alert. Living in the present moment, we need constant awareness, mindfulness, attention. In this way, we can check the restless, agitated, worrisome, and obsessive mind. We feel peaceful, balanced, and secure, and less self-centered. Our attachments and cravings become less and less and our minds become more light and free. So this is why when I first had the teaching in India about, about the understanding of the thought process, for me it was such a great revelation. And when there was, where there was that experience of silence, when the mind became silent by itself. And you'll notice as a way, when there was that experience of silence, not when I experience that silence. Because when the mind is silent, there's no thinking, and therefore no I. You understand? So that's why I say, when there was that experience. Because there was no I experiencing silence, right? <laughs> Because the I is a part of the thinking, huh? the, the mental noise we, we, we experience. Because when we are trapped in thinking, when we identify with thinking, which is what neurosis is, 
the mental delusion, every time we say I, we think this I is who we are, right? And we're very attached to the I. And, and the I has a lot of, you know, desires, hopes, but at the same time it has a lot of fear, anxiety. Because whenever we have any desires, craving, there's always fear involved. The fear, the anxiety, that we won't get what we want. Or we won't achieve what we'd like to achieve. So that's something that we can reflect on. How desire and fear, desire and anxiety, often go together. So although on the cosmic level, time is an illusion, <laughs> because when the mind is silent, we can actually experience the timeless dimension of the universe. That's being a young child again. But on the human level, the human time says it's time to end the session. <laughs> I'm going to throw this thing away, okay? <laughs> well, yes. yes, thank you, Martin, for the Nama sharing. Now it's time for some interaction. We don't have too much time, but we might have time for one or two questions. So we invite uh, participants online on, on Zoom, as well as participants here at VGF. If you would like to uh, interact with Martin, you want to share your thoughts, or you want to ask a question, yeah, you can take the mic. Uh, yeah. So does anyone have a question or a sharing? Yeah. Yes. Hi, Monday. Yeah, um, I'd like to ask uh, this question about fear and anxiety and how do you make use of this uh, mindfulness to deal with it? Uh, the situation is that uh, last week we heard the news on our one TV that uh, she may be diagnosed with cancer. Yes. Mm. Well, again, this is a universal problem, isn't it? <laughs> universal challenge that we experience. Again, you have to apply mindfulness. See fear as fear. And this is where the physical forms of, uh, dynamic forms of, of mindfulness can be, can be uh, useful. You know, like out of the hand movements, you know, the, the Qigong, you know, that release, we just did, just release any tension, any stress that's built up in the body. And of course, if you're, any physical thing that you, you're used to, you know, like running, some people do swimming, some people do Tai Chi, some people do yoga, the, all those things are beneficial. But the important thing is that you objectify the fear. Yes, there is fear. You can't deny it. There is fear, there is anxiety, there is worry. And at the same time, we have to reflect <coughs> on the nature of the body. Hmm? Because the body belongs to the changing conditions of nature. And as, as long as we have this body, this body, it will get sick due to certain conditions. Hmm? Because it belongs to nature. The body is anatta, or not self. For example, if you tell the body not to get sick, does the body listen to us? It doesn't. Doesn't listen. It will get sick due to certain conditions. 
It's like if you tell the body, you know, not to get hungry, not to get tired, not to go to the washroom, and so on. You see, the body does these things because it follows its own natural laws. Just like if you tell the body not to age, the body will age. And of course, if you tell the body not to die, the body will die eventually. So it's something that we have to understand. We have the wisdom so we can accept these things more easily, including the, the fear of death. Because as you know, death has always been a mystery. It's always been a great unknown. And out of that mystery, out of that great unknown, and because we have this thing called the human imagination, we imagine in ghosts and spirits. I mentioned it this morning. It has to do with that. Because you see the body of, say, a family member, you know, a loved one, and initially you're, you're always hoping that that person is going to wake up, right? But they don't wake up. That is something you have to accept. And then you imagine, where has this person gone to? This person that you knew so well. Where is that person? It's a mystery, isn't it? And out of that mystery and the human imagination, we say, oh, that person has become a spirit. Hmm? Hmm? They have become an invisible being. And now they are living in the spirit world but we can't see them. And this is why we do offerings. And you may notice during Hungry Ghost Month especially, they burn large um, incense, you know, the tall incense sticks, because you're, you're offering so much uh, things, also in public, right? Not only in the home, but in temple areas, but also in public, because you believe these Hungry Ghosts are there. And so we realize that it doesn't matter how much you offer, you know, food and drinks, these spirits that we believe in, they cannot consume the physical offerings. But they believe that they can consume the essence, the essence of the food and the drink. And by burning a lot of incense, you know, the smoke, they believe that the smoke carries all the nutrition, the goodness of the offerings into the spirit world. Now, although I don't, personally, I don't believe in ghosts and spirits, but I understand it and I find it very interesting, you know, from a cultural point of view. I, found, I find this very interesting. So it's because of that. But actually, we should not be afraid of death, because it's something natural. And we die simply because we were born, right? Because of birth. That is because of birth, there is sickness, aging, and death. It's really that simple. And this is why there's a beautiful Tibetan saying. It says, when we're born, we cry. But the world rejoices, you know, people are happy. And when we die, the world cries, but we may attain the great liberation, hmm? freedom from suffering. It's a beautiful saying. When we're born, we cry, but the world rejoices. And when we die, the world cries, but we may attain the great liberation, freedom from suffering. But in, in many Western countries, it's very difficult for them to accept death. Because, they, you know, they're trapped in the mind. Eh? They're very intellectual and they don't have Dhamma. They don't have the wisdom of the Dhamma. And so they're terribly afraid of death. And they, they don't see death as something uh, natural. Or they, they, they think that you, you should only die, you know, when you're past 90 or 100. They have that mentality. They see death as something awful, it's cruel, it's sad, it's unfair. Even during the pandemic, people thought, it's, all this is terrible. And every time they announce, say on the BBC, an example, 
the number of deaths. You know, they would say how many people have been infected today and how many people have died. They always use the word sadly and sadly, you know, X number of people have died or tragically, you know, X number of people have died. So they're always promoting that idea yeah, that death is something tragic, it's sad, it's not supposed to happen, but it is happening. You see what I mean? So it's a very immature, very ignorant perspective, view on, on death. And in the United States, they like to use the word unfair. Death is unfair. Because it, it's preventing us from having so much pleasure, <laughs> you know, and from, you know, getting more and more wealth and enjoyment and entertainment. So no wonder they see it as it's unfair. But from a Dhamma perspective, it's very immature. It's a very immature view on death. That's right. Okay. Yes. Um, do we have um, more questions? Or any, any online questions? No? Okay. If not, I'll, I'll ask the question. Alex? Uh, hi, uh, thanks for the insightful talk. I just have a question regarding uh, uh, intrusive thoughts. Like, um, so when, you, we, when we go about our day, because um, the mind by its nature is uh, restless and always uh, grasping other things. So in my experience, sometimes uh, I might have like, intrusive thoughts that make me feel uh, anxious or like, uh, guilty sometimes. So, I'm thinking like besides like um, like the right viewpoint, the right view on viewing these things is to like treat it as like um, not self. Like we can't really control these things, and we shouldn't worry about these things. Yeah, just ob objectified, just objectified. Yeah. Mm. So um, and that we should just focus on the silence in between thoughts, right? Like to avoid thinking and rethinking, um, uh, to avoid that. Grasping, I guess. Mm. I'm just wondering are there any tips or uh, besides the. You, you can do the hand movements. If you don't want to look at your phone, <laughs> I'm aware of the strong attack, uh, addiction, right? And, and to, to be aware of the anxiety behind that addiction because it is there and it is strong. And all I can say is I'm very fortunate that I didn't have these gadgets, you know, when I was young. Really, I w I'm very fortunate I didn't have these things. Yeah. And you're looking at somebody who has never sent a text. Can you imagine? I've never sent a text. But I can type like crazy. <laughs> I'm still using a laptop. I'm still using email. But a lot of people now, they consider email, you know, ooh, so slow, it's primitive, right? Because we have WhatsApp, right? I'm so cool, right? WhatsApp. But at least I'm on Facebook. I'm on Facebook. <laughs> so I'm only partly dinosaur. And actually, if you're on Facebook, you can just follow me. You don't ha we don't have to be official friends. Just follow me, Bante Kovida. And uh, you can read the... Uh, read some postings, I put some postings up, yeah. Another easy way of focusing your mind, if, you, if you're not inspired to do, you know, the practices, is uh, mindful chanting. And the one I like to recommend is, is a very beautiful chant from the, the Heart Sutra. And it's in Sanskrit, and it goes like this, Gatte, Gatte, Para, Gatte. Gatte parasam gatte bodhisvaha. Gatte gatte para gatte parasam gatte bodhisvaha. Gatte gatte para gatte parasam gatte bodhisvaha. And it has a very nice rhythm to it. When you get into it, it really is wonderful because it really focuses your mind. 
And even when you think there are ghosts and spirits around, if you chant this, they will go away. <laughs> I'll write it down for you. Gate, gate. And whenever we do the cemetery meditation, we want, this is one of the practices that we do. Apart from objectifying the fear, you know it's impermanent, and you do loving kindness, is also to do, do this chanting. Yeah. Who would be interested in doing a cemetery meditation? Yeah. But it, 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 it but it's really is in the imagination. It, it, it's the power of the imagination. And especially when you're young, right? When you're told at night, don't go out there, right? You go, right? You imagine them, right? They seem very real. Because in Jamaica, where I grew up, I had African uh, influences from the days of slavery, the African slavery. I, I grew up with these African ghosts and spirits, and there are many. And the African tradition is really strong, you know, in what we call storytelling, you know, the oral tradition, very strong. And I imagine these ghosts and spirits, and I really believe them. And at night, if I woke up and I heard sounds, I would imagine these ghosts and spirits. But only later I realize it's just the power of the imagination. So I like to say when I'm in Malaysia, Singapore, that because I grew up with African ghosts and spirits, I'm not afraid of the Chinese ones, okay? <laughs> no problem, they're not so scary. <laughs> but it's the power of the imagination. You know, one practice I do, and I dare you to try it, but it's really good. And I do this all the time to test my mindfulness and to see how powerful the imagination is. Yeah, I'm, okay, I'm alone in the evening, because there's no internet around, or I put it away. And I say to myself, there's a presence in the room. I say that to myself. There's something, a presence in the room. And the moment I say that, I feel goosebumps and I feel shivers. And sure enough, I can feel that presence, and it's always right behind me. And it's looking at me. Every time I do it, it happens. The same thing happens. It shows you the power of the imagination. I dare you to try it. And believe me, if you're not mindful, you want to get out of that room very fast. <laughs> Because it seems so real, that presence, and it's watching you, right? But if you apply mindfulness, you look at the fear, you, you look at that image that, that your mind has created, including, you know, all the sensations in your body, and it goes away. It's very powerful, the imagination. Okay, uh, thank you, Bhante, for sharing and also answering our questions.